gentlemen, and welcome to the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show. Guys, listen, we know that we are a little early today. Uh, we are awaiting our guest, uh, Mr. T. Lamp. And while we're waiting, Mr. T. Lamp, we're having a few difficulties, guys. You know how that goes. I mean, you you, you guys have been in this business forever. But while we're waiting on Mr. T. Lamp, uh, we can still move the show forward. And you'll see that young man's handsome face here momentarily. But uh, Mr. T. Lamp is a local icon uh, here in Shreveport, Louisiana on uh, WVMA Magic Radio 102 FM. Uh, he, his show is called The After Work Network uh, with T-Lamp. T-Lamp was born in Harlem, New York. He's an energetic, fun and positive, uh, his fun and positive style has been heard from here to the Midwest. T-Lamp got his start as the Saturday night announcer at WTLZ 1989 while attending Delta College. Now T-Lamp quickly advanced uh, to a primetime personality in less than a year and then was offered the afternoon drive and music director position by the legendary P.D. Kermit Crockett. Now, while working at WTLZ, he was offered a host position for the number one rated show, House Party, at the legendary WJLB in Detroit by none other than uh, world-famous Steve Hedgewood. Now, for three years, T. Lamp dominated the airways from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. every Saturday night as club hoppers had every radio on the downtown strip electrified uh, by his voice. He was uh, bringing the pain, guys. 1999, T. Lamp took on the challenge of taking the primetime position at KMJJ in Shreveport. Now, within months, he took the night uh, time ratings to a record level 36 shares uh, for people before alongside his own air partner, Lee Mack. Now, t Lamp was also the voice and co-owner of the number one website for promoting urban music for musicsnippet.com. In May of 2007, Music Snippet relaunched their website with groundbreaking event located downtown Manhattan, hosted by t Lamp and Misinformation from Hot 97, which featured Trey Songs, and Swiss Beats. T. Lamp loves all New York City sports teams and is a huge track fan. He also loves to talk politics and specializes in history, especially hip hop history. And we're going to cover some of that as soon as T. Lamp gets here. He's working diligently to get here with us, guys. Without ado, now we noticed that you've you, you've done work uh, 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 with Trey Songs and Swiss Beats, and and you, you talk about WTLZ and how you actually got your start. Will you kind of just give us a little intro into how you got your start and what interested you uh, in, in being in radio to begin with? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Mill, for, for taking the time to want to talk about radio, uh, the career that I love, which keeps me breathing. Okay. And I appreciate anything okay. for you, Mel. My and pleasure. I've been, no, no problem at all. I've been doing radio for 30 years now. Um, I started very young at WTLZ, Power 107, in 1989, November of 1989. And uh, Kermit Crockett was a program director. And uh, he was the guy that gave me my first chance to be on the radio. I was very nervous because I'm a shy person, naturally. Um, but I just wanted to do something different. You know, I was born and raised in New York City. Uh, by the way of Old Bridge, New Jersey, by the way of Spring Valley, New York. And I have relatives um, across the water in, in Ghana, Africa. Um, okay. Because my father is originally from Ghana. So I have people all over the world. But yeah, so though basically I got into radio listening to those big time radio personalities from 98.7 KISS FM in the 80s in New York City and WBLS as well with legendary uh, radio personalities like Frankie Crocker, uh, Chuck Leonard, Carol Ford. I'm talking about these are some of the biggest radio personalities, and they always intrigued me. I was a young child that had a boombox. In that area, everybody had boomboxes because that was the, the start of the, the hip-hop generation. So everybody had a boombox. Melvin, you know, a boombox, everybody had one of those. You know, so I would listen to the radio. Or I would listen to the radio all day. And I always wondered, I said, man, how do they always know what to say? Like, they always have something to say, and it's always colorful. It's always entertaining. 
I kind of thought I wanted to do it, but I said, I don't talk enough. I'm too quiet to be on the radio. So I never really thought I would be a radio announcer. But after leaving New York City, uh, I left New York City in 1986 uh, to go to college, University of Houston, uh, downtown. And uh, there, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, as being a freshman in college, you really don't know what you want to do. I hadn't really picked a major yet. But I went down there, met a lot of different people. It was a culture shock for me, being an 18-year-old coming to Houston, Texas. That was a culture shock. So I went down there, had a little bit too much fun. So I wind up coming back to New York for another year. When I came back to New York, I really made a decision that, you know what? I wanted to be on the radio. So I was looking for a good school to study at. And I found a university, uh, a small college in Michigan, Saginaw, Michigan, called Delta College. Uh, I looked them up on the map. They had a dorm there. So I could actually move there and live. So I saved up all my money. And in the meantime, while saving up all my money, I was still getting my juices going, listening to the big time radios in New York. So I knew I really wanted to do it, but I had to start somewhere. So I, I, I saved up all my money. I moved to Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, I took up some classes at Delta College. They had a good broadcasting program. And I started listening to the local radio station there, WTLZ Power 107, which is still there today. And I called the program director. Kermit Crocker said he liked my voice over the phone. And uh, he called me in, started me, um, just started talking to me every week and said, hey, why don't you come up um, Saturday night? And I want to see how you sound, you know, just see how you read. And uh, took it from there. Started overnight. Kept moving up, moving up, went from overnight, went to prime time. Then I went to morning drive. Then I went back down to middays. Then I went to afternoons, became the music director. And it's history from there. I've been having a, a, a 30 year career ever since. Wow, man. Listen, that is really, really exciting. Listen, let, let me ask you this. You, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned Crockett like in your voice. And, and many times, you know, we, we, we have people say things like, well, you, you have a, you have an announcer's voice. You don't mm -hmm. have an announcer's voice, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. In your professional opinion, how mm -hmm. important how important do you feel that a person's voice or the vernacular of that voice, uh, how important do you feel uh, that that is in getting into broadcasting uh, in and of itself? I think it plays a part. I think it does play a part, but not everybody is blessed with a, a beautiful sounding voice and um if that's the case and you really want to do radio you really want to make that connection with the, the people radio or television then you're going to have to unlock that beautiful personality that god has blessed you with everybody has their own unique personality everybody is different there are no not two people alike on this earth to this day so if you don't have that strong deep they call them pipes in radio uh, you come with a beautiful personality. If you say interesting things that can draw people to you, you can have a wonderful career in radio. And radio is that intimate connection. You know, it's just something about that music. You're playing that music, that classic soul music or that hit record, talking in between it. It really draws people to you. You feel like you know that person that's playing that music for you. So it's really a rewarding experience on both sides for the radio announcer and for the person listening definitely that, that's rich that's rich you know i i, I noticed in, in in your in your bio information you 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 discuss uh just liking music in general i know that you you talk about history and hip-hop history and 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 uh that kind of thing share with us a little bit about uh, uh if you were to say to me being quote a greenhorn in the entertainment uh -huh. business or the speaking business, and you say, well, I love hip hop history. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. uh, one would understand that, but mm -hmm. if you were to break it down for us, what would that touch upon as far as hip hop history? The hip, as far as hip hop history, it, it played an intricate role of my life. You gotta, you gotta keep in mind, um, I was a teenager in the eighties in New York City, <laughs> in the New York area and it was such a big influence in that area. It still is to this day. I was around rap music before it was even being recorded on racks. I was around rap music when it was recorded in a park, you know, with just a bunch of people around breakdancing with a DJ playing the music. And 
an MC try to hype up the crowd with, with some, some rhymes and stuff. So it, it played a major influence on me just growing up with rap music. It influenced how you talked, um, how you dressed. I mean, it was, it was a beautiful time for rap music in the 80s and even the late 70s as well. And that had a big influence on me. And just to watch rap music grow to that mainstream form, because, you know, when I got on the radio in 1989, all the program directors and, and music experts said that um, rap music was going to be a fad. But people that grew up in that area, we knew all along that it was not going to be a fad. I mean, we just never even accepted that. And you see, it's the biggest art form in music today. It's changed a lot, um, but it's the biggest selling art form today. And, uh, and like I said, it's, it's a rewarding career for me. I just got on the radio side of it. And after getting into radio, I got a chance to actually, you know, meet some of the people that I grew up listening to, which was very rewarding as well. I always dreamed I wanted to interview some of the biggest stars in radio, television and movies. And uh, radio made that all possible. And it's like a dream come true, a shy kid from Spanish Harlem. And as you share, meeting some personalities mm -hmm. without putting you in a box. Mm hmm. If you if if you were to name your your top two personalities that you were afforded the opportunity to interview, and I know there may be two hundred yeah. that you really yeah. like, but right. but if if you were to to kind of put them one two, who might those persons be? One and two. That's a good question, you, Melvin. You asked some good questions. Well, thank you. Uh, because you know I talk to a lot of people, Melvin. <laughs> but if I had to pick two. I'm going to say the biggest person I ever interviewed, and I interviewed him twice, would be Tupac Shakur. I interviewed him before he was famous, when he was just a dancer for okay. Digital Underground. And uh, he just came up to the radio station. They sent him up to do the interview because he had a concert in Saginaw, Michigan, along with, um, I think it was Heavy D and Public Enemy on that ticket. And uh, he came up to the station and did the interview. And then I interviewed him once again after he became very famous uh, with MC Breed. MC Breed was a pretty good friend of mine. You know, well, God bless both of them. Rest in peace. Uh, he introduced me to Tupac at a live broadcast that I was uh, doing for uh, the radio station. And I got a chance to talk to him then and put him live on the radio. Uh, he That was a big moment for me. And number two... I'm going to say Eddie Murphy. I had a chance to interview Eddie Murphy in 19... I'm going to say that was around 91. He had a song out, If I Was a King. Remember Eddie Murphy was trying to sing? Oh, yeah. He oh, yeah. Chabaret. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I talked to him over the phone. But it was a long, extensive interview. Uh, at the time, um, he was his, his family was suffering from the flu. And it was going around his house and he had the kids in the background. And we talked for about over an hour live on the radio about his music career. We talked about music. We talked about up and coming comedians at the time. This is, the, this is, this is around the years of a living color. Uh, Martin Lawrence was hot. Damon Wayans was very hot. And I asked him who did he think was going to be the next big comedian or who his favorite was. He didn't say Damon Wayans or Martin Lawrence. Uh, he said Eddie Griffin at the time. And Eddie Griffin wasn't really that known yet. And I remember running into Eddie Griffin uh, many years after that. And I told him that story. And uh, he got very emotional. He thought that was a, a pretty big compliment. This was off the air. It wasn't an interview. I just had ran into him at a casino down here in, uh, in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah, but the two biggest stars, Tupac and Eddie Murphy. Wow. You know what? <clears throat> May I segue into R&B? Now, I know, I know especially for old guys like me. There's a me lot too. of talk, and, and you've alluded to it already, you know, about how they say, well, hip-hop is just going to be a fad, et cetera. And older right. guys like myself, uh, Brother mm -hmm. brother T. Lamp, yeah. <laughs> I kind of always talk about, you know, there's no more real singing anymore and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So, and this is not one against the other, but if you had mm -hmm. the opportunity, being in your generation, being in mm -hmm. your generation, if you had yeah. the opportunity to listen yes. to Luther or to listen uh -huh. to Tupac, which one uh -huh. do you think it might be? 
Oh man, you are something else. <laughs> wow. That's like an apple and an orange. You know what I mean? I know. I know. They're both, they're both so different. You know, Luther, one of the best voices. He's in my top five male best voices of all time. And Tupac, Tupac's early stuff, um, so much emotion in his rap with songs like Dear Mama and stuff like that. Uh, love that song. Love that, it. That, love that, it. That, love that it. It, 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 it was like a poem, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah. Man, if I had to pick, I'm probably going to go with the Dear Mama Tupac. Okay. Dear Mama Tupac okay. Luther. But that that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, and if you had to pick one that comes to mind from Luther, what do you think that one might be? Just off the top of your head. I mean, I I, I know there are so many classical songs that, that you know, he sings or that he's sang, but what... Which one do, do, do come to mind that, that you think would get your attention uh, more readily, let's say, maybe than some of the other ones that he's saying? A House is Not a Home. Okay. A house is not a home. Okay. Uh, yeah, so many. The Power of Love. Oh, my yeah. God. Luther, so many. I mean, and Luther's that type of artist, you know, he's signature Black radio. Yeah. You know, Black radio loves Luther Vandross, and he will always be played 100 years from now. Uh, but yeah, all his music will always be remembered. You know, I'll, I always think about R&B music. And Melvin, I say to myself, if you had to pick one album, Melvin, because you were trapped on an album, on an island, and you can only pick one album, I'm going to tell you what my album would be. What would it be? Know? Yeah. Keep Sweat, Make It Last Forever. Oh. <laughs> That's the most perfect album, R&B album, in my opinion, that I've ever heard because that's when I was in college in Michigan in 1988. And um, I had my little, my little work study job. You know, I was cleaning the dormitories and I used to bump that album. Now I know every song on that album and I could lit that song. That album still sounds good to this very day, by the way, but yeah, make it last forever would be my all time favorite. album. Well, well, you know, but you know what T lamp again, as an old guy, I mean, I can't debate that brother. I love Keith Sweat's uh, "Make It Last Forever," man. You know, and 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 and, and since we're talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, music and entertainment, etc., I <clears throat> have you found have have you found being presently in the entertainment business mm -hmm. that we generationally refuse to give props uh, to those artists that are just good and captivating in what they do because we try to stay in an era have you, you found that to, to to be an issue now maybe issue is not the right word i'm looking for but have you served or, or dealt with much of that when you're dealing with these professional artists in various areas that they have difficulty uh giving props uh to good solid uh musical entertainment because they try to quote rep their area yeah. Or have you found them to to be genuine and just admit, hey man, this was dope, regardless of the era of the of the sound. You 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 run it you run into that division. Um, you have this so called old school and new school, and um, mm -hmm. you know sometimes you do see new school artists that they either just don't know or don't care to learn the history about where that real sound really comes from. And you do see that. Then you see old school cats that, that are not willing to um, accept the new music because it's gone in a different direction now. You know, it, it's, it's, more, it's more in a sort of negative way. Um, you know, but for instance, rap music, you know, when I came up, it was all about having fun. And it, and it went from having fun to educating um, African-Americans about their history. And then it went to gangster rap. And now it is where it is today. So it, it's gone in a totally different direction from where I grew up. So people like me from that old school era find themselves not even listening to uh, the mainstream anymore um, because they can't relate to it. They're not talking about issues in the world like mu music from the 70s and, you know, music that, that talked about love, about what was going on. You know, we were used to hearing that, growing up with that. You don't really hear that 
a lot. You have some artists out there, but and the ones that do talk about it, they're not promoted. You don't hear them as much. So you find a lot of people find, drawing themselves listening to those old school classic radio stations. And, you know, I'm coming from the mainstream radio station. You know, now I'm doing classic and r and I made the switch a year ago. And um, I didn't want to really switch it first, but I had to. I'm older now, and but I'm glad I did. You know what I mean? I'm glad I did. You know, you listen to my show, you're going to hear music anywhere from Michael Jackson to Prince to oh, yeah. Surface, Ready for the World, Anita Baker. You may even hear some Slick Rick or some Heavy D, or you hear yeah. the new stuff, Bonfire, Fantasia, Maxwell. This is what I'm into now. Right now, I find myself being loving 80s music. I'm like an 80s DJ now because I was a teenager in the 80s and it was a good time for me. The world was different in the 1980s. And uh, so I'm leaning more towards old school. I like the new school stuff too. I could play it all day long, but um, I'm leaning more towards the old school. That is that division, but uh, hopefully uh, that will change and music can change and start talking about what's going on in the world tonight, today, Melvin. It's saying it was different, and, and uh, Overture was saying 88 was a great year. Uh, that kind of, You know what? And, and see, I have, there's no shame in my game, uh, Brother T. Lamb. Yes. People all the time is that when I was young, I was mm -hmm. a young old man. Now mm -hmm. I'm an old man. I'm an old young man. And be, I'm just being oh. honest. Yeah, man, I'm serious, man. You know, I enjoy I enjoy great music. Uh, I, I've always been a hopeless romantic, man. I love, I love ballads, you know, music that, you know, talk to the ladies and that kind of thing. But being, right. but the poet in me, mm -hmm. I, I love rap. And people mm -hmm. say, what? But now gangster, I'll be honest, you know, and made it, and that's the old man in me. The gangster mm -hmm. rap, I can't wrap my head around. Right. <laughs> I, I rap my, and, and what I mean by that is, is if, I'm I'm my 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 whole discussion is about destruction and murder and disrespect of women. I just can't get ready for it. Now the beat may sound good, but I listen to words. So yeah, yeah, you know. So so as you mentioned, uh, I'm maturing more, and as we get older. But and and, and I, I I know you don't have all day. I know you have to go get on the air, and we had a few technical difficulties there. So so let me let me let me wrap this up. What's up? If you were to yeah. give advice, and I know a lot of yeah. times, you know, people ask this. It, it, it's really a cookie cutter question, but I really because I have a lot of young listeners. I see sending up thumbs and all of that up here. What advice would you give to young individuals that that really think they want to get into the broadcasting business, uh, radio specifically? Radio specifically, for the young people out there. Um, I, have some I have some YouTube videos posted online, but I give a tutorial about why I love radio so much. Just um, type in T Lamp on YouTube, and those videos should uh, pop up. But someone wanted to get into radio. Well, me, I, I went the route of going to college, um, taking up mass communications, electronic media. Now, I went to college way back in 1988. I went for two years. Then I came back almost 20 years later and got my bachelor's degree in electronic media at LSU. So I would recommend people to definitely um, pursue at the college rank, um, go to university, um, take up electronic media, mass communications. It's very fun. It's a rewarding career. And you can use that degree even if you don't wind up getting in the radio. You can use it for journalism. Uh, you can use it for television. You can, be, you can use it for public relations. It's so vast with that type of degree. As far as the radio, you, you study it professionally, take the school ranks, and how it would help me to get really better at radio, and I'm not saying I'm so good, uh, reading out loud, reading out loud, reading in the shower, reading a, a newspaper article out loud to yourself really prepares you for having a great broadcasting career. I'm talking about television or radio, because that, those are some of the basic things you're going to have to learn if you're going to choose a career in radio. Far as your electronic personality, that will unlock itself when you get those basics. But go to school. Take the school route. Um, study it. 
Um, then while you're in school, um, apply for an internship at a local radio station and take it from there. But always practice on your own by reading out loud and uh, reading clearly to yourself and listening to yourself. After you listen to yourself, and sometimes it's hard to listen to yourself, but in order to get better, you have to listen to yourself so you can correct the mistakes that you need to work on. If you do that on a regular basis, you will become really successful in radio. And uh, that's my advice to you and to all the young people out there. I love okay. radio. Okay, great. Well, thank you. I, hey, man, they're, they're killing you with the thumbs up in their hearts. Listen, final question. Dr. Tachi, Dr. Tachi wants to know, what do you feel about the state of radio and, and where do you think radio is, is headed? Good question. Good question. I'm glad she asked that, by the way, too. Uh, radio is very different now, Melvin. Um, when I got into radio, you know, we had a playlist that we had to follow, but I had the leeway to play some other music of my choice. A uh, radio is no longer like like that anymore. They have music consultants that pick all the music for the DJs that you hear playing every day. Mm -hmm. um, so very different. And also radio is different now as to where you have um, many other formats. Like when I got on the radio, pretty much you were kind of forced to listen to the radio when you wanted to hear a new song. Now it's not like that. You have the internet, you have, you have a serious satellite, you have Pandora. You basically can program your own radio station in your car. So there's many other outlets. When I was in radio, the request line would ring all day. It doesn't ring as much. People are still listening. Radio is always going to be around, but they have other outlets now. They're on their phone all day. You know what I mean? They're playing what they want to hear on their phone. So they, don't, they can find out. If they want a new album, they could sign up to a music service and have it and program every song that they like when they're at the gym in their headphones. So there are other options, but I still, free radio, the radio that I'm involved in, will never go away because it's an intimate broadcast between the listener and the DJ and the music, and that will never go away, and it's free. But like I said, there are other options out there. Syndication has done different things to radio now as well. You have all these syndicated shows that are playing in every market, I guess it's a good thing. It, 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 it is a, it's a good business decision for a radio station to put on a syndicated program. And it's a lot more cost effective, but it will never replace that local DJ in your market that's letting you know what's going on in your city playing music that people in your city like compared to someone in another state. Everybody has different listening patterns. So... I don't like the syndication has done what it's done. It's taken away a lot of jobs as well. I'm one of the ones that's for local personalities um, representing their city um, because it's a more intimate approach. You can put on that, that syndicated morning show. They may be talking about what's going on nationally, but what's going on in your community locally. Uh, that's, that's always going to win in my opinion. And I predict in the next maybe 10 to 20 years, you're going to start to hear more local radio stations put on local um, personalities more because they're, they're going to be bringing in higher ratings because they're right there in the community. That's my prediction. And that's what I hope. And that's what I pray for where radio is going. Well, uh, Dr. Tashi and, 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 excuse me, and Ms. Overton are saying that, that they are agree. And Dr. Tashi says that it's interesting to her. Now, listen, and, and again, I, 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 uh, I always encourage uh, my listeners, when they are sending me the thumbs up and the hearts to let me know where they're from, they always follow that. But uh, uh, they're certainly listening. So I have to be a man of my word. You have you have been here with me uh, for a while through all of the all of the glitches. We we got it on. It is a, a final thing. The final thing you you like to share before we ask you to tell individuals how they can contact you. Oh well, you can you can contact me. Um, you can look me up on Instagram. I'm T Lamp. T L A M P 102.9. You got to put the 102.9 in there. You can find me that way as well. I have a bunch of videos on YouTube. I want you to look up if you're thinking about getting into radio. Just type in T Lamp. Um, I have some good interviews up there. I have some good tutorials. T slash L A M P. It'll pop up. You can also listen to me 
um, nationally around the world at magic1029fm.com. Magic1029fm.com. I'm on every night, Monday through Friday, um, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Central. It's classic soul and smooth R&B. You're going to hear like Michael Jackson, Luther Vandross, Heavy D, along with the new R&B from Alicia Keys, uh, Bonfire, Fantasia, all that good stuff. And you got me as well. I focus on being positive. My show is more positive than controversial. So definitely. And I'd like to send out a big shout out going out to all my family in Ghana, Africa, all the Lamptees. Um, I'd like to send out a big shout out to all my family in New York City, all my family out there in Michigan as well, and Shreveport, Louisiana, and New Jersey, Old Bridge, New Jersey, Spring Valley, New York. These are all the places that I have lived. And I love all my friends, and I wish they all could listen to me all the time. And thank you, Melvin. And this is a, it's a wonderful experience. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm still old school, but we finally got on here. <laughs> no, no, Brother T. Lamb, thank you, man, because you could have said the heck with it, and, and we're just happy that you're here. And let me personally thank you, man. I told you, I love your station. I listen to you many times in the afternoon, and I definitely love when you play my boy, Bingo. When you play, it's written all over your face. It does something because people, a lot of people, I have to tell you, Lamp, a lot of people didn't know him. And he went through a major transition. Please allow me to say this to you. He went through a major transition and he started doing gospel. And I have two of his gospel albums here with me. I don't know how many people have ever heard his gospel music before, but I'm just yeah. going on record saying to you as my friend, T. Lamp, you are welcome to any one of those to any one of those albums. And uh, when I hear it's written all over my face, man, obviously it brings back memories, uh, uh, you know, of, of bingo and, and that kind of thing, man. So I do appreciate that. Also, I have a knucklehead cousin. I, I was watching on YouTube uh, when they talked about uh, uh, no loyalty, no royalty. And he, he, he's a former member of the Tony, Tony, Tony. His name is Vincent Lars. He, he was a tenor oh, saxophonist. Man. He was a tenor saxophonist. Uh, for Tony Tony, and and I Wait, thought about man. you again, man. I I, I was listening at, at them. So listen, we we really appreciate you appreciate you being here, and we will have to do this again. And we just want to thank you uh, uh, very much. And and any time uh, we can share, please let me know. So uh, for for all of our listeners, for the, new, the nobody asked me guy show. I'm your host Melvin Lars. And again, guys, as you know, I'm a poet, writer, etc. You know, my latest book is called Mothers and Their Men. An introspective look at mothers rearing their sons. You can get copies from Burn and Noble, or you can get them from me. Join in with us uh, next week. We will have uh, Dr. Denise Walker. She's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a family therapist. She's a professor at ULM in Monroe. The following week, we will have uh, none other than Mr. Emery Camel. Now, most of us are familiar with the Gullah language in Gullah country, etc. Uh, Mr. Emery Cameron will be here with us uh, as well. And then following that, if I can ever slow Doug Williams down enough, uh, Doug Williams is going to be on here. You know, we always talk about the first African-American and win the Super Bowl and all of that. But believe me, Doug is much more than somebody that won a Super Bowl. So again, we want to thank each and every one of you for being here with us. And uh, we want to give all homage to my brother, T. Lamptey. Uh, T. Lamptey, say hello to the family for me. And we want to thank our guests. So everybody have a great evening. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen.